okay, all right, okay. Here we go. <laughs> it must be 2 o'clock, 2 o'clock, rock on Friday. This is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel, and that is Ethan Allen. Say hi, Ethan. Howdy. Good to be he, here again, Jay. He's our resident scientist here on Think Tech, and he comes up with stuff, <laughs> and then I get a chance to ask him questions <laughs> about it. And today we have two areas of, uh, of thought, literally thought. Yes. Exactly. One is, uh, you know, an, an MIT article, MIT technology uh, article, and you can take a look at that. Um, it's very good. It's in the Technology Review of MIT. It's under www.technologyreview.com. Anyway, the article where, uh, you know, uh, running off is first computer to match humans in conversational speech recognition. Now, we've been <clears throat> seeing and working with Dragon Dictate and, and the like. Um, on computers for as long as computers, at least personal computers, have been around, right. uh, where we can speak to it and it can listen. And now we have Siri and, and the comparable program on the Android, and it can understand a lot of what you say, but it's not perfect, right. and you wouldn't count on it. And I, I got to add that I use something called SpeakWrite, and SpeakWrite is a non machine way of doing this, where I make a sound file, I dictate a letter or something, uh, and um, <clears throat> through technology, that sound file goes to somebody in the Philippines or India, and they make a perfect, you know, uh, uh, translation of it, a trans, tran, uh, tra, you know, transcription. transcription of it, um, and it comes back to me just perfect. Uh, well, not quite perfect. Right. Not quite perfect. <laughs> That's uh, the only thing. sound. Right. So, but this MIT article suggests that we are now learning to deal with more than just strictly the sound, the phonetics of it. Right. We are learning to incorporate other factors and vectors and, and signals that people use when they communicate, and thus we can, we can learn a lot more about what somebody wants to say, and we can make a, a, a perfect transcription of it um, using this new technology. And that means that we will be able to command computers to do things with 100% you know, reliability. Well, okay. Well, tell me what's <laughs> happening. No, it, it, it is true. We, there, there have been some speech recognition programs. Yes, there's the, the Ringer app on the phone. I don't know if you know Ringer. If, if you and I get Ringer, we can talk on the phone and then get a transcription of our conversation back from Ringer. It, it takes both of them to get, have somebody sitting there listening, and they transcribe with probably 95% accuracy. And yes, now by taking a lot of the non-verbal but, but audio cues in the speech, the pauses, the uhs, uh, the sort of little sounds you make, what do they call them? Background sounds, basically. But, but it's voice. Right. And, and a machine could, uh, you know, characterize that pretty right. easily. Exactly. So if you're talking and I say, uh-huh, uh-huh, I'm encouraging you to, to talk more. Yeah. If you're talking and I say, uh-huh, I've now sort of said there's something wrong, I'm not understanding you, right? And it's a very subtle distinction there, really. And you don't have to train it like you had to train Dragon Dictate way back when. Yeah. It, it'll know from all that you are and say. And I suppose it can catch somebody with an accent, right? Uh, coming would, from another country, would, second language, all that? I would guess that they have to give it a big training session first, though, with, with a, lot of, a lot of this kind of stuff going on that, that it has to pick, pick up and do it through adaptive learning. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know how they do all this fancy stuff because it, it is very high-level computing. I'm wondering if adaptive learning really ultimately will be necessary because I can, I can feed it the accents. I can have, the, oh, this is a guy with, uh, you know, a Pakistani accent, and we know what that means, so we're going to figure that out. You know, it's a lot of data, but theoretically you could put all that data in this program and it could, you know, make choices about where this person is from and therefore how he says certain words in English or any other language. Right. I mean, all of this is possible. Um, what, what, what interests me is not so much to pick up, you know, the words, to, to find the language, you know, the linguistic context of it, um, or even, you know, the us and the ahs and how that might affect the meaning that he's trying to convey. What interests me is the, um, the context, mm -hmm. the thought context, and this is really directly related to our dis larger discussion right. tonight about science looking into thought. Right, right. right. So if, if, if the machine figures out by some key words that we're talking about widgets, right. then, you know, if I use a word that's, uh, that has a, one context around widgets, but another context around apple pie, the machine knows we're not talking about apple right. pie, we're talking about widgets, and it's going right. to pick that is going to choose that meaning rather than apple pie meaning. Right? Exactly. I mean, I've been impressed just really in the last few weeks, my smartphone has started transcribing voicemail messages that are left for me. Yeah, take it in. So, so 
they show up in print. And sometimes they're You're very- You're gonna get charged for that, I know you are. <laughs> I haven't said this, but <laughs> sometimes they're very accurate, but other times it, it does, it just obviously has no context, and it, it's just sort of, it, it's almost like word salad that it's doing, you know, it's, it's just picking up on words and trying to figure out what words it yeah. thinks it heard. Well, those tra those uh, translations are really not all that good. Right. It's enough to get the idea but you have to build the context right, right. in your mind. Right. And it would be far better if the machine knew what the, con right. figured out what the context and, was. And you know how we're gonna know when this has really succeeded? Yeah. When the machines start making puns, right? When they, puns? Yes, when they start playing with the words, then you'll realize like, they really do. When a machine comes up with, you know, time flies like an arrow, fruit flies like a banana. Oh. Then you'll, you'll, you'll know so the machine- rewriting what you're saying. That the, the machine really understands what, what the language is all about. But that leads to a whole new thing. It, you know, it's not just the puns. It's going to improve what right. you're saying. Right, right. You, you said it, you know, in a klutzy right. way. The machine knows what you mean. Right. The machine is going to clean you up. Well, already, I mean, <laughs> you, you know, your, your edit track changes tends to pull everything out of passive voice and put an active voice because it believes the passive right, voice is bad right, and klutzy. Right, and, right. And I it wants, see that. And, but know. this will be oral. Though. Yes, right. Well, yeah. oral to writing. Right, yeah. So, the I, gee, I, we should all live so long to see this come <laughs> to fruition. But it's it really, you know, we're at a place where a lot of data, a lot of processing can be put in a little, a little thimble, yeah. uh, and it can do all this processing, multiple languages, multiple accents, um, multiple contexts, um, and it can be as good as any human or a composite human. All humans can understand all other humans. Isn't that something? <laughs> well, one of the things, they, they, the point they made in this article was both machines, when they transcribe human speech, and people, when they transcribe, have a certain error rate. Now that they've gotten machines that are about as good as people, but they, the types of errors that they make are very different. The machine has trouble with, with those little, little sort of background, almost nonverbal things, the ums, the uhs, and people, that doesn't give us pause. We, we know that perfectly well, and we're able to deal with those. The machine has some trouble w with sort of s small words that get dropped in the, uh, and, and doesn't sometimes get those in perfectly. This sounds so exciting. Why, why is it exciting? Because the payload is so huge. It's the Tower of Babel. We still have that in this mm -hmm. world. But maybe can all come together and everybody can understand everybody. The question I put to you, though, is do we have to teach this program, the one in the thimble, do we have to teach this, the, all these rules, these sound rules and thought rules and context rules and language rules, do we have to teach the machine this, or can the machine learn these rules by itself through artificial intelligence and I, what you called it something else before, where you, the machine learns? I mean, is it really possible for the machine to learn like that? That's pretty complex, though. Yeah, that, that is a whole area, that, and I know very, very little about it, but the, the artificial intelligence folks are getting machines to learn in ways that machines could never learn before. They, it's not just a matter of that you had to plug all the right stuff on in and, and the machine simply could do sort of high-level computation on the data you plugged in. Machines are actually now able to take experiences and interpolate and extrapolate from them, apparently. Uh, they have figured out how to make the circuitry cleverer to do that. Uh, I, I don't know how, how that's done. But yes, it, they're, they're learning in new ways, which means, yes, with a, a limited data set, they'll be able to start using language now in, in new ways. Yes, when, when the machines start writing poems, good poems. Beyond puns. Well, poems have puns. Right, right. Yeah, but I mean, that would be pretty thrilling to see your language sort of fly, your language right. expanded, right. your language improved, yeah. your whole thought process because right. of a pun or a poem. Um, gee whiz, uh, it would know what's in your mind more than what you know <laughs> is in right, your right. mind. It would take us all to a new level of thought. No? Right, yeah, when your smartphone starts expressing your thoughts better than you can express your thoughts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, well, and then, you know, I mean, I hate to say this, but we, we always, you and me, we, Ethan, we always get into these things. Now the machine is looking into your mind. <laughs> it is finding thoughts right. in your words that you right. didn't realize you had. Maybe right. it, it is learning more about what you were thinking than you thought what you were thinking Exactly. And therefore, it can find things perhaps that the government doesn't like. Right, yeah. The thought police are coming <laughs> for you now. <laughs> yes, it can, it can be finding patterns in, in your speech that re reveal ways that you're thinking 
uh, patterns that you would be completely unaware of and those around you would be completely unaware of because, yes, we have the, these amazing capacities now to gather these monstrous big data sets and track them and use them in interesting ways. Uh, Stakes are high. It is. It's you know, because it's a lot le you know, easier in this world to just articulate some words instead of write a, write a note to someone. <laughs> you know, I would like to be able to walk around all day. I mean, it's just sort of like, like the cop you know, who wears the microphone or the camera mm -hmm. and, and speak to people, mm -hmm. speak to my whole world. It's sort of like email on steroids. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I have a friend in South Africa. I can talk to him. Mm -hmm. I can say, I want to talk to my friend in South Africa. Bingo. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm sending him an oral message. I don't right. have to write it out. Yeah. And, and we have this coming. And it leads me to another really interesting question. So we have, um, we have uh, Alexa here. Alexa, uh, what is artificial intelligence? Sorry, I can't find the answer to the question. <laughs> See, she should know. <laughs> she should. She, I mean, I'm disappointed, actually. <laughs> Alexa, what is intelligence? Hmm, I can't find the answer to the question. She needs training. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, you know, that goes to my question. We have Alexa. Alexa's right. coming along. You know, every Friday, Amazon sends out a, a, a rather lengthy email telling you all the new things in Alexa. And I just got this fire stick thing for my TV, and it has the same kind of technology. You push a button on the remote, and now you can talk to the television and tell it what you want in terms of movies, news, uh, music, you know, just talk to it. Um, and it understands you really first time around because it knows what you're saying, you know, against the database of what it has. That's quite interesting. And then Siri, some people swear by Siri. Right. Some people swear by, by the, uh, you know, Android uh, sound, um, sound interpreter. Mm -hmm. Um, Mike, so a question I need to put to you, and this is really important, is in our world today, our world of science, our world of MIT, our world of Amazon and uh, Alexa, Alexa, I was only kidding. Um, <laughs> she might have a comment. <laughs> Thank you, Alexa. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, a Siri on, on Apple and uh, the Android. Um, where is this going to happen? Is it going to happen in the laboratories of MIT? Is it going to happen in Apple? Is it going to happen in Samsung in Korea? You know, um, wh where is it going to happen? Where, where is the big drive going to take place? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, this, it ties back to our, our earlier dialogues about, about uh, self-driving cars, right? I mean, there again, they're doing the same thing. They're making a lot of decisions about the world and about how to interact, what's happening. They're predicting and, and behaving appropriately. Yeah, where is that happening? I mean, uh, Tesla is gathering data from all of its new cars all the time. Those cars all have always on internet connections, and Tesla is gathering information from all those sensors. It has millions, probably at this point, billions of miles of driving data on, on its cars. That's what you've got to have. Yeah, and, and it, from that data set, yeah, it can probably tell you a whole lot about how you, how you drive, how the guy beside you drives. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And, but you need that. Yeah. You know, and that is the current challenge in information technology. We know we have big data. We know that from science, pure yeah. science. You're a yeah. scientist. You know how, how big those spreadsheets and data tables you know, can get. But we have to take all the data about a given subject, whether it's driving or simply understanding what I'm trying to communicate to you, and put that somewhere in the program. Uh, and then we have to connect it up so that it is interpreted immediately okay. um, and so that it learns. Right. It learns when it makes a mistake or uh, something new happens and it needs to know something else. Right. It is able to learn with artificial intelligence. Right. And so that then brings us to the point of do these computers have what, what you call theory of mind, right? Right. And what, and what does this conversation between <laughs> you and me and the people have to do with monkeys? Because we did say, you know, what, from machines to monkeys. And so we need to know, but don't answer that yet. We're going to take a break and come back. And we're going to connect this all up with monkeys. You'll see, Ethan. <laughs> Good afternoon, Howard Wig, the host of Code Green for ThinkTechHawaii.com. I appear on Mondays at 3 in the afternoon, and my gig is energy efficiency. That is the cleanest, quickest, safest way that we're going to get down to 100% clean energy by the year 2045. And that's not that far away, but it is doable. Just join me, Mondays, 3 o'clock. Aloha. 
Hi, I'm Crystal. Welcome to Think Tech. My show, Quack Talk, normally airs at 10 o'clock on Tuesdays, but it's going to change to 11 o'clock. So don't miss it. It's an hour later. You can sleep in a little longer. Come with me and engage in some sensitive, provocative discussions on everything. It's all good, all right? Women's issues, things that people don't dare talk about, we want it on the table. So join me. Wow, the plot thickens. <laughs> Here with Ethan Allen and me, Unlikable Science, on a given Friday at, at 2 o'clock clock. So now we're going to connect everything we've talked about before, should we dare to do that, <laughs> in terms of machines recognizing speech and thought and expanding on what your thoughts might be. We're going to talk about new theories of thought in general between human people and monkey people and, well, every <laughs> other living thing, I suppose. Right. So. And we're talking about theory of mind, Ethan. Right. I know this because you told me about it. <laughs> so why don't you tell the people to? So theory of mind is this idea that others have beliefs and feelings and thoughts about the world, and that these may not necessarily be the same as your own beliefs and feelings and theories about the world. So it's, it's often demonstrated by a, a so-called false belief demonstration. So if we can look at this uh, on the table, and I don't know, okay, great. Here we are, so let us just say for, for fun that I have this piece of candy and I've decided I wish to hide this piece of candy. So I take and I put it under this cup. Now, Jay, you're sitting there watching, you're sitting there watching me do that, you know it. I get up and I leave the room. Robert, the floor guy, comes over here, pulls it out there and sticks it under the red cup. Now, when I come back in the room, and, I, and you know I want that piece of candy, because I walk back in the room and say, man, I'm now hungry. I want that piece of candy. Where am I going to look for that piece of candy? Under the cup. Under which cup? Oh, the teacup. Right, the white cup. Right. Yeah. So that's where I put it. But you know perfectly well that I will do that. Yes. You, you understand. I, I saw what you did and right. saw. I looked through your eyes. Right. And yet you know perfectly well that's not where, where the thing is. You right. know that it's here. You, you could tell right. me, indeed, that it's under the red cup. So I know both ends of it. I know, right. I know what's in your mind, right. Right. and I know the reality. Right. And that, that ability to know what's in another's mind is theory of mind. It, that is, it says, I believe that others sort of like me have a mind, sort of like mine, and it will behave in that same way. I would have been fooled, too, if I had walked out of the room and hadn't seen the switch being made, right? Okay. The theory so, of mind. Theory of mind has been one of these sort of psychological treasures that we have always considered unique to people. We've always said it is only people that have that. No other animal has really demonstrated theory of mind until just recently this set of researchers uh, got some chimpanzees and orangutans and bonobos, uh, little, little, little chimps. Essentially, they, they did the same kind of false belief experiment and they tracked the gaze of these animals. Now, it's been a whole new technology they use with infants and showing how much infants know. So watch where the infants are looking, and you can tell a lot by how, how much, how long they'll look and where they'll look. Okay, and so you have described um, that I see uh, the, the candy under the teacup, mm -hmm. um, and I know that the, the candy has been put under the, under the plastic glass. Mm -hmm. So I can appreciate you who left the room and didn't, didn't know all that. Mm -hmm. I can appreciate your state of mind. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, make me a monkey. Some people think I am a monkey. <laughs> make me a monkey. How does it differ with a monkey? Well, that's the that's thing. Apparently, it, it really doesn't. Apparently, the monkeys know that if, if, if now let us say this is a banana, you know, that, that I, have, I have gone and I have you know, hidden here, <clears throat> and you decide, like, you want that banana, right? So you go and you, you take this and take it away where you know, and you know perfectly well you're sitting there in your tree, and when I come back in, you laugh at me as I come up here and, <gasps> where's my, where's my banana? It's a joke, right? and my monkeys can yeah. laugh. Too. They have humor, don't they? They, can, <laughs> they, they do. They, they can't do. make puns. <laughs> <laughs> we don't think so. <laughs> that may break down, too. But, but again, this, this does get us to this area of understanding the context, understanding the, the other's viewpoint, basically. So it, the monkey has the same ability to understand what's in your mind Right. Even when you're wrong, right. well, especially when you're wrong, that I do. Right. We and monkeys were the same that way. Yes, and, and yet again, you know, for a long time people regarded themselves as very special. There were animals and there are people. And lots of people still talk about that. So there's people and there's animals. 
I don't like that distinction. We are, we're animals, every bit as much as monkeys and ants and birds and fish. Okay. You know? So we found this one little sort of layer yeah. of, of consciousness that's common to human beings and monkeys, that this is a discovery. Yeah, well, it used to be that we thought there was this sort of giant gap between all animals, all other animals, and people, right? And we were the tool users, the tool makers, the thinkers, the language users, blah, blah, blah. Little by little, that's breaking that's down. That's been, been eroded and eroded and eroded. They found more and more animals that use tools in various ways. They've now got the, the you've seen the videos of the Caledonian crows who make tools, actually. They bend wires to make hooks to get things out. Uh, <clears throat> uh, more and more animals use very sophisticated language. I mean, if, if you look at the work with the bees, these bees are communicating how far to go, what kind of food source you're going to find if you go this direction, this far in that direction, and whether it's a worthwhile food source and how many bees should go off to, to, to pursue uh -huh. that. Yeah. I mean, it's very sophisticated communication. So what's left? I mean, when well, you, well, you know, the was, was, one, was one of the few things that was left. That was set. What is left? Yeah, very little, very little. <laughs> this is why more and more it's clear to me, we are, I mean, we are just animals. Yes, we're, we have a little bit bigger brains, a little more sophisticated wiring up in our heads than a lot of other animals, but... I mean, it's not much. It, it's not really a, this big qualitative difference anymore. It, it's more of a, yeah, we're a little better at this task and a little better at that task. But let me submit to you that maybe we're, you know, we're looking more carefully right. and we're finding more similarities. Right. But at the end of the day, um, you know, they're not going to, animals are not going to be able to do philosophy. Uh, they're not going to be able to read books uh, in any great detail. So they're not going to be able to build computers uh, or build speech recognition programs. But now, are our computers going to be able to do those same things? I mean, you know, they, they now can obviously read books, right? They're book reading machines, basically, yeah. that, that read books. Can a, could you hook up a book reading machine to discuss Faulkner's works in an intelligent fashion? Yes, uh -huh. you could. So basically, then you're saying, so you, you know the, 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 the Turing test? So uh, Alvin Turing, one of the early computer guys, said the day is going to come at some point when if you're behind a curtain, you won't be able to tell whether you're talking to a machine or to a person. And when, when that day comes, when you can't, can no longer tell whether you're talking to a machine or a person, the computers have basically achieved humanity in some, in some very real That's sense. That's very scary. And we're basically... We're, we're going we're, we're, to we're see getting it. There, there, Those, the that, outlines are getting yeah, clear that, that, that we can do that. Yeah, and, and this MIT article really shows, that, yeah, you can do this in casual conversation. I yeah. mean, it used to be one of my favorite things I read years ago it was the Dear Doctor program at Stanford. This is back in the, back in the, the day. But they set up a, a program that basically just took what you would type into a computer and it would type it back to you as a question. And they sort of set it up as, as a psychiatrist. So you'd walk in and you'd say, I was having dreams about my mother. And the computer would type back to you, what sorts of dreams about your mother? Oh, you know, Liza, oh, Liza. Oh, oh I, I dreamed she was killing me, you know. Yeah. Why do you think you dreamed she was killing you? Yeah. And, what they found was this was an incredibly popular program. They actually had to take it offline because basically people were just soaking up all the computer power. This is a DOS you, program too, using, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, right. It was very old. You know, this was way back when. Yeah. You know, and that that was very good. Now imagine you've got some someone who can talk in very real human language to you, hooked up to a machine. There was a like movie that. about this. Some fellow fell in love with his computer. Oh yes, right. And, yes. And um, you know, I mean, I, I really think that's coming where we live in a nuclear world, we're in silos, we don't have uh, friends or people who listen to us, they don't have time to listen to us, so we could get a little, it's coming, it's within the next five years, mm -hmm. I'm sure, that you can get a, you know, let's call it Ethan, okay, <laughs> and, and I can talk to Ethan, Ethan will listen to me, Ethan will respond to me, Ethan will take my thought process <laughs> higher, right. he will entertain me, he will right. educate me, all that. Yeah, so, so you, you want you want something like Alexis there, but, but sort of warm and soft and furry, right? <laughs> and Coming. Yeah, yeah Coming. I mean, that I is. think you can get Alexa, <laughs> Alexa with, whoops, I'm going to activate her. You can get Alexa with a male voice, too, uh -huh. you know. It doesn't have okay, to be right. female and right. all that. But, you know, take me back to the, the nexus we were searching for. Mm -hmm. Where, how does this connect with the monkey who has maybe a greater level of consciousness than we thought? Well, my question to you is, are these computers that are able now to, to converse with us in human speech, do they have theory of mind? Can Whoa. they have theory of mind? Whoa. Because are we like them, or are they, uh, do they not? And I guess that will be the ultimate test. Sometime we'll have, we'll have to hook some of these computers up and see if they understand false belief, basically. 
I can't do that <laughs> for you, Hal. <laughs> the 2001 Space yeah, Odyssey exactly, comes to mind. Exactly, right. You know, I don't think we're that far away from no, that. No, no. You can, you can, if we can do this, you know, if, if, you, if you do it mechanically, um, you may never get there. But if you do it by artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and somehow allow the artificial intelligence to create this uh, theory of mind, then it seems to me that you could do this. You know, the computer could be aware of its own consciousness. Yeah, yeah, and be aware of the fact that there are other intelligent machines around and that their views of the world may differ from its view of the world because of their, their experiences. Yeah. yeah, and so for that reason, the identification of this layer of consciousness in the theory of the mind, you know, uh, research with, with monkeys becomes important. Right. Because it means that, you know, we can make the same analysis with humans and and with machines, and have a machine, who, ooh, then talking about ethics, you're talking about all kinds of sophisticated right. human choices there. Yes, exactly, exactly. There's all kinds of, of different sort of moral ethical Huge. Uh, horizons that we're facing now. Huge you know? issues. Yeah, yeah. So the uh, Gen X people, the millennials, they can look forward to being essentially uh, either in competition or supported by machines. You, you, bet, you better hope Asimov's three ro rules of robotics, you know, three laws of robotics come, you know, come into play here pretty quick, right? That, Which are? That, you know, a robot can never hurt a person. You know? <laughs> oh, right, 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 right. <laughs> well, you know. well, you know, it's funny how science fiction becomes reality. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Here's another example. Right, exactly. Well, all I can say, Ethan, is I always learn a tremendous amount from you. And we started out, I was skeptical that you would be able to connect up the um, the theory of mind with uh, the MIT article on <laughs> speech recognition, but you have done it yet again. <laughs> well, thank you. It was, it was a pleasure and couldn't have done it without you. Uh, it was, uh, it's always fun getting the great stuff that you send along and, and thinking about it and thinking like, oh, that reminds me of this. And, you know. It's not only great to be a scientist, it's great to be around scientists <laughs> who don't mind answering your questions. <laughs> thank you so much, Ethan Allen. Thank you, Jay. Fun to be here. Bye -bye. <laughs>